<laughs> so you saw the stand up with Swami. Now that's a sit down with Steve and Jim. Uh, this is my uh, good friend for many years, Jim Ruff, who is a local here. And uh, he was featured, uh, one of the people featured in the book I wrote with Bruce Lipton, Spontaneous Evolution, uh, in the chapter called Healing the Body Politic. So this is really an amazing opportunity. First of all, I, I want to thank uh, Rick Lukens and United Earth Network for putting this together and bringing these people together and actually creating something that I've dreamed about, an on-the-ground group of people ready to um, transform, starting their local community and then eventually the world. So this conversation is, uh, I, I won't call it serious because it's not too terribly serious, but it's about uh, taking the ideal and turning it into the real deal. And one of the reasons why Bruce Lipton and I featured Jim Ruff and his Wisdom Council and Wise Democracy is that it really offers a way for us to do something that hasn't been done. Uh, you know, we, you know, you've probably read Marshall McLuhan's book about the Global Village and his prediction that we would have this network of communication and so on. And so we do. But as somebody brought up in the first part of the program, we have social media that is much more top-down imposition of narratives than bottom-up and networking um, among, uh, among ourselves. So we still have this great tool. We still have the internet. And fortunately, we still have the outer net. So here you are on the outer net. And uh, so the conversation today is about how we can cohere uh, that, that part two of the upwising, this uh, coherent voice of we the people. Uh, so, the, I mean, imagine, look at the situation that we have right now uh, in the Middle East and in Ukraine. People in the world are crying out for peace, and yet we haven't yet been able to speak in that coherent voice so that we can uh, deal with the sociopathogens in the body politic and establish a sane and sacred center in our community. So, um, I want to introduce you to Jim Ruff. He's got a great book called Wise Democracy. He's done his wisdom councils all over the world and in this country. So why don't you introduce us, uh, Jim, to what is, the, what is wise democracy? What is the wisdom council? So we have a system that doesn't allow for collective intelligence. It, it kind of worked when we were just a few people on an in, uh, you know, in an infinite world, but we're structured to be competitive. It's structured as a competition of special interests. There's no, there's no public interest. There's no collective intelligence. There's no conversation. It's just competition, and somebody wins. And now we know who won. Game's over. When do we start talking? When do we? We have to work together. So this is what we have is a, a strategy for how to facilitate that coming together globally and nationally and, and regionally, locally, whatever, at, di at different levels. How do we facilitate that coming together of all of us so that we can be collectively intelligent? So given the, uh, given the idea of coming together, tell us about the actual structure of these, of these wisdom councils. How do they work? Who do you bring together? Under what auspices? What occurs uh, during this, this process? Okay, when, when I wrote my book, I assumed it had to be a constitutional amendment for this to work. And we've learned that we don't have to do that. So now it can be done by just us. That's... Just us could do this. We can do it in, in Port Townsend. We can do it in Washington State. We could do it globally. And what we do is we randomly select from, let's just do it globally, from the population, the global population, just 12 to 16 people. That's all we need. And what we've done, nobody gave us permission to do this. We have created a legitimate symbol of all the people. And then they go into a room for just two days 
and they are facilitated, there's the magic sauce, they're facilitated in a way that they come out of the room excited about how different they all were and how they reached unity. And they walk into an audience of celebrities, uh, of people, maybe randomly selected people, and they, we have TV cameras, hopefully, but they, they present their unified viewpoint in just half hour. They, they, so we take, they start out with climate change and they reach a unified viewpoint and they're telling a story of how they got to that. And then the audience turns their chairs and talks. And hopefully we have circles of audience from a, a broadcast audience perspective, a social media audience, uh, you know, an ongoing. And the Wisdom Council process they they say this, and then the audience says, basically, yeah. Why aren't we doing that? It's so commonsensical. Of course we should do that. Of course that's the problem. And so here's a way very quickly to facilitate a near unified view of a very large system of people. We can all look and say, oh, well, yeah, that's, that's the we, the people perspective. And it can happen nationally, and it can happen globally. But it's a process, so we then do it next month. We do it with a different random group, and they, they maybe take the same issue or they take a different issue, and they, we go through the same thing. And what we're really doing is we're facilitating the missing conversation. We don't have the national conversation of all of us coming to a unified viewpoint. We don't have that, and we have to. Here's a way to facilitate it. You know, this is really, really interesting because um, there is such a thing as we the people. This is this imaginary uh, entity, we the people, um, that is really, uh, according to the Declaration of Independence and really the, the, the Constitution, that is the ruling power of this, of this country. That is the, the sovereign. And yet we have not really been able to speak in a coherent voice. So I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine a group of, of people, again, uh, randomly selected, not selected, you know, we need like two donkeys and two elephants, not like that, not like Noah's Ark, but uh, randomly selected so that we're representing not just groups, but humanity itself, the collective of humanity. Now imagine taking these issues that have divided us in this country, guns, abortion, and so on. My sense of this, and having attended uh, two of these wisdom councils, uh, one was done at our, our home in Santa Rosa a number of years ago, the other was convened in Oakland, California, and watching how this process worked, I'm convinced that if we got this group of uh, ordinary people together, the collective wisdom of that crowd facilitated through this dynamic facilitation, would in fact, uh, the group would come up with an idea, a, a, a policy, a direction on these very divisive issues that 60 or 70% of people would agree would be the way to go. Rather than leaving them to the extremes on both sides, which have been controlling the conversation. In fact, there hasn't been a conversation. It's basically been grenades lobbed over over a wall at one another. You know, the joke is, uh, you know, it used to be that uh, our our dysfunctional process was described as rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Now it's all changed. Now the two sides are actually throwing the deck chairs at one another. That's where we've devolved to. So now we actually have a situation where it's possible for people to actually have a real conversation, listen to everybody in the room. When I was in the room in this Wisdom Council, whatever people said went up on the board in various different categories so that every piece of offering information that that group had to share was part of everybody's understanding. And then uh, the, in, through the process, we looked at all of these things, and at the end, came to something that everybody agreed 
was a, was a universal understanding of that issue. So imagine the energy that's wasted right now on the battlefield, on the battlefield of two sides fighting one another rather than finding what they have in common. Uh, I want to tell a story about uh, what we put in, the, in spontaneous evolution. And Jim, you'll correct me, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I guarantee he'll correct me. But, <laughs> but uh, it was a group of people discussing the abortion issues this many years ago. And uh, again, there was a lot of contention on both sides. And when the shouting stopped, there was this quiet space. And from the quiet space emerged a common understanding that everybody in the room agreed on. And from what I remember, what everybody in the room agreed on was that every child should be wanted and loved. Am I correct? Or what am I missing there? Well, we would... It, yes, you've got the essence of it, that's right. But we would never use the word agree. Yeah. In the other word words, what? Yeah. what we do is we set up a, a way of talking and thinking that the word agree or the word disagree would never appear because we're always co-creating in this environment so that we, we reach a unified viewpoint. The way you get to a unified, the only possible result is a unified viewpoint. And the way you get there is you, you get rid of the judgment. And so you make a creative environment so that you need, if you have a breakthrough, then if you and I have a breakthrough, then I, I look at you and I think, boy, that was a stupid idea, I thought, but I'm sure glad you said it because now we've got something better than I ever thought could be. So in other words, we reach unity because we're different. We celebrate difference. So there's a, di so, but our system is structured to be what I call decision making. It's all based on judgment. You, your voting is a judgment. You can't do creativity and judgment. They don't go together. So you, yeah, we, we, I know we have a, I know we have some teachers here, in the, art teacher here in the class, but you're, you can't do judgment and creativity. So, but our system is structured to be about judgment. We use, so we don't use the word discussion, we don't use the word proposal, we don't use the word recommendation, we don't use the word decision, we don't use the word agree, we don't use the word. We set up a system of thinking in the small group that is entirely a creative process where people make progress through shifts and breakthroughs. And then they look at the end, at the end of two days, they say, oh, I don't know how we got to, how did we get to this unity? We use the word unity. And, and so people, and, and then you, we try and export that spirit to the group that's watching, and we try to export that spirit to the, on, to the larger population of us all in an ongoing way. So there's a missing conversation that's based in creativity, and we, want, we need to add it. We have to have that conversation. We all do it in real life. We step back and we, we think together and we, we think with our heart and we, we talk with respect. That isn't there. It doesn't exist, but we can facilitate it. See, what's really, really interesting is if we, if we look at the, the tremendous frustration, I think there was an article in the New York Times last week and the weekend before, and it was about uh, political attitudes in this country, and the headline was, disgust is not strong enough a word to describe that. And that disgust is that recognition that in our hearts, in our true human hearts, we recognize that there are virtues and values that the 90% of us who are not sociopaths um, uh, support per, uh, and, and appreciate. And so the way that, that we somehow overgrow this system that is so bent on keeping us divided so that we don't hold the system accountable together. Uh, the antidote to that is unity without uniformity. And one of the great things about this Wisdom Council process is that nobody is trying to convince anybody of anything. Everybody has a separate viewpoint. When you take all of these viewpoints together, they create kind of a full spectrum so that every 
sliver of light is represented. And from that full picture, uh, it becomes easy to see what we need to do. The native peoples, uh, in describing the, the, the circle, sitting in, naked, in the sacred circle, it's we talk and talk and talk until there's nothing left but the obvious truth. So we don't get to do that collectively here uh, because the media so far has not permitted that. The media doesn't even have two opposing points of view anymore. If you watch this channel, they've already just made their mind up and this is how it is. And you can't color outside that box. Look at this other channel, the same thing. So what we have is dueling dystopias. So if you don't want a dystopia, you got to go for datopia. So <laughs> this is datopia where we actually collect and cultivate the, you know, the wisdom of the crowds, the, true, the wisdom of our hearts, the common sense, the commonly sensed common sense that we have. So um, I know there's a lot more that we can say, but um, if we have a, somebody who is willing to go around with a microphone. Um, yes, so you're generating these policies from your wise councils. Um, how can you affect change in the wider world with, with these? So <clears throat> uh, there's, we've been brought up to think that Everything is about policy, you know, and really what, if you and I, if it's, it's possible, if you and I can somehow facilitate one whole system conversation of all of us where we reach unity, well, there's no higher authority than that. I mean, that's it. And it's really kind of what happened. It is ex almost exactly what happened when the founders created this country. They had a guy named George Washington. Everybody knew he was king. And he, he said, I don't want to be king, thanks. Uh, but I'll be, okay, okay, I'll be president of your convention. And the convention met. They weren't random. But they met in the spirit of, they were supposed to be in parliamentary procedure, but everybody in the room knew that it had to be unanimous. It had to be everybody. So they reached a unified viewpoint, just like the Wisdom Council process, and they disbanded, just like the Wisdom Council process, and they said, here's what we think ought to happen. And then all the states went off and said, okay, well, we'll you know, they had a government already. All the states went and said, oh, we can do that, we can do that, we'll have a ratifying convention, whatever. And then it was like a claim. Everybody said, okay. Let's try it. And it was really hard to find anybody at the time. I, no, okay, now I'm ignoring the Native Americans and the blacks and the women and the non-property holders, et cetera. So, so give me a, cut me a, some slack. But, but the point is, is that this is a process that we all know in our hearts. And when we all look around the virtual room and know we're all in unified position, well, then everybody just goes and makes help. We want to make it happen. It's a new kind of economics. It's a new kind of governance. It's a new kind of culture. And it has to happen. It's not an option. We can't do competition as our basis of our society anymore. We have to work together. And here is a way to facilitate that. And let me just say one thing about facilitation. It's a model of change that people use the word, but... It really is cool because you, when you are facilitating a room full of people, you didn't get their permission maybe, but they're all thinking at a higher level. We didn't have to educate them about how to think in the spirit of choice creating. They're just there. And, and that's the power, of, that's a powerful model of change that we tend to forget exists. I think what you're talking about is context. And the context that we are in is in the culture of separation. And the culture of separation, we are expected to be this versus that. Uh, like even if you think about it, um, the false contradiction between 
individual rights and collective well-being. Somehow they're made to oppose one another when actually what would happen if they went together? What would happen if we cultivated that wisdom together? So in, in terms of policy, the question is first we need to have this coherent way of seeing things and recognizing that we're cultivating this wisdom together and then the policy naturally grows out of that. Uh, well, one quick comment about the, um, the founders of this country. One of the afflictions we have in our current culture is the flattening of history. I, my, this is, a, this is a seriously happened. A couple of years ago, I was trying to get as much life out of my very, very ancient iPhone as I could. And I walked into an AT&T store and the young guy working, he goes, wow, this is a really old cell phone. And I said, yeah, this is what they used in World War I. And he goes, oh, really? Yeah. So, so what happens is we tend to look at the founding fathers and we tend to go, well, they had slaves. Uh, they uh, decimated the native peoples, the women. You know, somehow they, did, they forgot to include the... Um, uh, with the um, Council of Grandmothers when they took the, the governance system from the native peoples. You got to realize that for those times, it was radical what they were doing. They were basically saying that our rights do not come from kings, they emanate from our existence, right? So let's be, let's be, have some perspective and recognize what it was like, what a breakthrough that was in, in the 1770s and not flatten history and take it from there. Okay, more questions. Yeah, um, I see there's a, a sheet being passed around to sign up. So I'm wondering what will happen if we put our name on this, we'll get emails, phone calls, what will um, we be able to involve ourselves in? Well, first of all, there are actually three separate uh, entities. There's the uh, the um, um, yeah the United Earth, which is the organization yeah, that the Wise Democracy one and Wise Democracy. Yeah, that's and the one I'm asking on, about. No, okay, so what'll oh, what'll happen if you get on the Wise Democracy list? Well, Saul, you're part of a committee. <laughs> that is meeting to talk about a local wisdom council process here in Port Townsend, which that would be, if people are interested in that, then maybe you would, they would be talking to you. Um, I'm, I'm interested in global and national, and I would love to have a conversation j just with people who are interested in talking about that. You'd be surprised how few people want to talk about that. So, except in Europe, by the way. In Europe, I'm, I'm a rock star. Okay. <laughs> in two states of Austria have adopted the Wisdom Council process into their constitutions. And so I, we've got experience. There's a real live, large scale experience. And, and it's, it's just, it's working dynamite. People are really excited about it and so forth. So, and I, I'm trying to always trying to figure out a better way to talk about this. So I've got four questions here, a little little piece of paper. Uh, what's your biggest wish for human society? Uh, can the To Be Project achieve your wish? And then that's so each one of these has a QR code to if you want to read more about it. And then uh, can the To Be Project also work for America? Yes. And can you? Can you help? You know, basically the four questions. I'm trying to bring about the pot, rather than talk about the meta crisis and how awful things are, I'm trying to push that aside and just say, let's aim for as high as we possibly can. Let's try and remember how to wish like we used to as kids and aim for that star and let's see if we can't get there. So basically, there's, I, I would love to talk if people are interested about the Global and Wisdom Council process, and then there's also a committee of local, people interested in the local Wisdom Council process. Quick question. You just mentioned, uh, will it work in the United States is one of the questions, and that was my question in a sense. Why do you think 
people seem to have a better grasp about your work, this idea, in Europe than in the States? Well, it's two two reasons. One, I think, one is it's, it's the German-speaking lands. And I think that they are really interested in the process. They, they got it, that they were the bad guys, or their parents were, or their grandparents were the bad guys. And they get it, that they really aren't bad people. And how do we, what the hell happened? And they want to know. And so they're interested. They're leaning forward when I'm talking about this. How, I'm talking about how do you, it, to me, it's not, a, to me, the culture is secondary. It's really the structure. You structure a system that I call it the triangle with the, with, you know, an autocratic structure. And you, you get a certain behavior from people. You get a certain kind of culture. We're all loyal subjects of King so and so, Trump. If you get, if you structure what we have, we have a competitive process. And we got the rules of the game up there. That's the Constitution. We have a competitive process. And we can't do that anymore. We, we, it's a monopoly game, and we, it's like they already own Boardwalk and Park Place. It's no fun to play, you know? And it's not fun. So, how do we go to that next system? So there's that's one answer is that the the Germans and the Austrians and the Swiss, the German speaking Swiss and the northern Italy, all the German speaking lands can hear. They're they're totally interested. The other piece, I think, is that in the United States, we are built on an, a set of ideas. And so the Constitution is sacred to us. It is our system, and our system is terminal. How do so when you say that, people want to scream at you. They get mad at you. And but the point is, is that this doesn't do any we're not replacing that. We just take that gift that we were given and we're adding the missing piece. We're adding the piece, the 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 whole system, the we the people conversation is missing. And that we the people conversation requires a different kind of thinking than what we were set up with. It requires the kind of thinking that they were able to do at the founding. Question over there. Okay. In some ways, your process it sounds like uh, the process of building community. I'm wondering what is the role of conflict in this process? Is, it, uh, is that something that's encouraged or, or is the process structured in such a way that that doesn't really come up? Great question, yes. And the answer is yes to that. In other words, what we do in the small group process is we have four charts. And the charts are lists of, you know, uh, solutions, concerns, uh, data, and problem statements. So no matter what anybody says, when somebody tries to be arguing, for instance, like, oh, that's a pile of crap, you, the facilitator jumps in front of that person, protects the other person, and says, tell me more. You have a concern. Let me write it on this list of concerns. Now, you have a different set of data. We want to write that up, too. And you have a different solution. Maybe you could tell us what's your answer. And so what's happening is we're just structuring it so that whatever you say can't be an argument. It's just always a contribution to what we're doing here together. We're solving this mess. And it's an emotional mess. We want to, we want to follow your energy. If you want to say it with all this anger and vitriol, great. We need it because that's how we're going to find, that's how we're going to find a breakthrough is that energy that you've got. So it's, we're structuring that in the small group process. And then what our trick is, how do we facilitate that in the whole bigger system, that same quality of thinking? And we got some strategies for that. <laughs> It's the, the secret seems to be in the circle. Uh, in a circle, everyone 
on the periphery is equidistant from the center. So there's, this, there's already an equality. So everybody in the room is equal. Everybody in the room has equal um, agency in this process. And so every one of their concerns that goes up on the board is essentially metabolized by the group, that it becomes part of whatever the decision is. It's something that's built upon. So what would we would call conflict, this versus that, is always encouraged to be adding on. Tell us more. What is your concern? It's a really, really brilliant process, and I'm certainly hoping that the people in this uh, in this town, in this area, take advantage of uh, having Jim here as a resource, or as we call it, a we source, for we, uh, a we source in this town to, you know, first of all, whatever the local issue is that there, that we would want some coherence around, and then also looking at how this can be scaled. I want you to imagine a national conversation that has not taken place. A national conversation outside the auspices of mainstream media and mainstream narratives. A national conversation where every voice uh, can be heard, at least metaphorically, um, representing everybody, all of us, so that, uh, that everything is so fully expressed that what finally gets decided is a... Um, a, a something that is baked, so to speak, out of the wisdom of all of these individuals. So I, I want to, we're, we're kind of running out of time. A new shipment will arrive tomorrow. <laughs> we're running out of time. But fortunately, you've got this resource right here. So I want you to give a big hand for Jim Ruff. He's rough and ready. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much for being here.